sockeye salmon, the backbone of British Columbia's ecosystems, cultures, and economies for thousands of years. As a naturally occurring food source, they are an unparalleled resource, a protein full of essential omega fatty acids, called essential for a reason, because humans can't live without them. In Canada, there is no greater naturally occurring source of these essential fatty acids than the Fraser sockeye. If permitted to thrive, they will naturally return by the millions, a force of nature breathing life into everything it touches, like we saw when the Fraser sockeye returned in 2010. But the return of 2010 does not mean that all is well for the Fraser sockeye. Far from it. Unfortunately, 2010 was a standalone anomaly. The overall trend for the last 20 years has been a steady and dramatic decline in the Fraser sockeye, culminating in the crash of 2009. In 2009, DFO had forecasted a healthy run of 10 million fish to return. However, they were way off the mark. Only a million sockeye returned to the Fraser River that year, a mere 1% of what the run was a century ago. While fishermen in British Columbia were tied up to the docks, just north of us in Alaska, fishermen were having a banner year for sockeye. You look at the entire coast of Alaska and our runs are healthy. If there's a forecast, you can, you can count on it. We, we know where our fish are going. They don't just disappear. You know, there's never, okay, where did all the fish go? We know. Salmon runs are doing well in most of our neighboring northern countries, Alaska, Russia, and even Iceland. There is something unusual happening with the salmon of BC. There is one new factor these models are not taking into account. Since the early 1990s, the fish farming industry has been rapidly expanding on the coast. There are now over 120 fish farm sites in BC waterways. Approximately 70 of these salmon farms are located in the waterways between Vancouver Island and the mainland directly on the migration route that most of the juvenile Fraser sockeye smolts travel after they've left the Fraser River on their journey to the North Pacific. At a glance, the salmon farms look benign, but the story is all unfolding beneath the surface. Much of the information around the impacts of salmon farms has focused on sea lice, but these farms harbor a much more insidious problem. Crowding a million large carnivores in high concentrations creates the perfect breeding ground for diseases, as well as disease mutations. The list of diseases that are common in fish farms is long. Companies must treat their fish heavily with vaccines and antibiotics, but it is the nature of viruses and bacteria to adapt and mutate especially in crowded conditions like this. We've already experienced these types of problems associated with animal feedlots, such as the swine flu and bird flu. Like H1N1, fish farmers must sometimes call their fish when a disease gets out of hand. But more often than not, the diseased fish are allowed to stay in the water, where they provide a continuous source of disease. And once a farm has disease, it quickly spreads through the narrow channels with every tide. In one tide cycle, particles can easily travel over 10 kilometers from their source. There are papers out there published in Europe uh, that have called salmon farms pathogen culturing facilities because of this dynamic. Now, we've studied it thoroughly with sea lice because sea lice are basically cheap and easy to study, but it's the same dynamic with bacteria. This is a Norwegian paper published in the Journal of Diseases of Aquatic Organisms in Norway a strain of furunculosis, which is a bacterial disease, entered a fish farm and spread rapidly between the farms to 70 wild salmon rivers. In Canada, nobody's tracking disease. There's no reason to suspect that dynamic is not occurring here. So in 2007, most of the Fraser sockeye went this way. These are the fish that did not come back in 2009. But the Harrison sockeye that left the same river that went through the south, they survived extremely well, better than was forecast. The, the sockeye that left the Columbia River also did very well. 
and the sockeye that left Hayden Creek did very well. So that suggests the zone of impact of what happened to these fish is somewhere in the Strait of Georgia to the beginning of Johnson Straits. And in this area is a large number of salmon farms. We need to know what was going on in those farms in 2007 when these fish went out. This run of sockeye also did extremely well, better than forecast, and it passed no salmon farms. So it begs the question, what went on in here? We do know that when that ill-fated run left the Fraser River as smolts in 2007, they were fat, healthy, and extremely numerous. In fact, it was the best out-migration in recorded history. DFO claims that perhaps there wasn't enough food for them in the Strait of Georgia, and they starved. But a local researcher remembers them passing through the Discovery Islands. I was sampling sockeyes first. I know I was the only one sampling sockeye in this area in 2007. I know there's lots of people that say they might not have made it out of the river, but what I remember seeing was lots, and the numbers that we collected that year would suggest the same thing, that they definitely made it this far, but they didn't make it home. We DNA'd a lot of the fish we saw in 2007, and they were Fraser fish. Jody Erickson has grown up in the remote waters of Okasolo Channel. He has watched the changes in the local ecology since the fish farms began to proliferate in its backyard. There's always disease problems. Um, you don't always hear exactly what it is, but they'll foul farms for a year or two at a time. Diseases are extremely contagious. All you have to do is talk to a fish farmer. I know tons of people that work on fish farms. Their biggest concern is diseases. They have foot bass. Whenever you get on a farm, they spray their crew boats down. They won't go in between farm and farm if there's any diseases. They're just incredibly contagious. But if you're a little wild salmon and you don't know about these rules and you just swim up the channel past one farm and then past another farm and past another farm, by the time you get to the top, you've gone by 30 farms. You're gonna be catching whatever they happen to have, whether it's sea lice or diseases. These fish could have a disease right now and nobody would know. They could very easily be transmitting diseases north of here everywhere they go. If you send a sick kid to school, there's a pretty high likelihood he's going to infect his classmates. And these fish definitely will be in contact with all the fish as they travel north. It's that obvious if you're out here, but I've been doing it six years here and I've never seen one DFO boat. If you're not out looking at the fish, it's pretty easy to be confused and say there's no problem and anything you want, pretty much, if you've never actually came out and looked at them. No biologist is allowed to find out what is going on in these fish farms. I know because I have tried. Uh, it's in complete lockdown. The Ministry of Agriculture and Lands is fiercely defending the salmon farms. The fish farmers say, we can't have this information because it's going to impact their share price. Well, <laughs> I mean, that tells you right then and there, there's a problem. So the only people who actually know what disease is on these farms is the fish farmers themselves. The Ministry of Agriculture and Lands does little spot checks, but their sampling design is so poor, uh, no graduate student would ever pass his exams if he sampled fish the way they do. One of the few epidemics we do know about was the IHN epidemic that apparently started in Eastern Johnson Straits. One of the farms became infected with IHN and it quickly spread to the neighboring farms. Then a boat carrying farm fish, young farm fish, traveled up Discovery into Johnson Straits, into the Broughton Archipelago, and as they were going by these infected farms, they picked up the virus, and then the disease began to spread everywhere as this boat had been. This is 12 million Atlantic salmon that became infected with IHN, and they are right on the Fraser salmon migration route. These are the fish that came back in 2005. They had the same collapse pattern as the ones that came back in 2009. That means the ones that went out the south end of the island did very well. The ones that swam through the fish farms did very poorly. That's a big reason why I think the 2009 sockeye vanished due to disease. 
It may be a coincidence, but salmon farms began experiencing a series of IHN outbreaks in 1992, which happens to be the same year the Fraser sockeye began their steady decline, one which would continue for the next 18 years. There's also <laughs> the enormous threat of infectious salmon anemia. So everywheres in the world these Norwegian companies have operated, they have brought this virus with them. In Chile, when they imported infectious salmon anemia by mistake, it wiped out 70% of the salmon farming industry down there, but they are unable to put fish back into that water because they keep getting it. That means it's lodged in a wild population. They'll never get rid of it. If we get ISA here, we could lose all our salmon runs, we could lose our herring, we could lose everything. Because if you introduce a new fish virus into a, a place that uh, has never experienced this virus, you have no idea what you can do. I mean, it can be like touching a, a torch to gas. It can just spread. These little guys, these viruses, bacteria, and parasites, they are incredibly successful organisms. You do not want to mess with them. There is strong evidence that the Fraser sockeye are already affected by some kind of pathogen. One scientist working within DFO has found an extremely high expression of genes that are associated with a virus in the brains and livers of the Fraser sockeye. Genomic evidence indicating that some kind of pathogen, likely a virus, has been affecting a high proportion of Fraser sockeye for many years. In this unreleased report, Miller states unequivocally that Fraser sockeye were entering the river in a compromised state. That there has been a high but variable presence of this signature since 2003, which is when the study began. And that in 2007, more than 90% of the smolt sampled had this disease signature. She also states that this unhealthy signature is strongly associated with the fish that go through Johnson Strait which happens to be the stocks that must pass by the concentration of fish farms. The research is not yet publicly available, and if it links fish farms to disease, DFO will likely do its best to suppress it. There has been a decision at some level of government that wild salmon just have to go. Wild salmon are just inconvenient to the politicians because they have to say no to all the hands that feed them. All the big business that want to log the rivers, mine with open pit mines, drill for oil in near shore waters, dam the rivers, divert freshwater in the United States, all of these things are prevented by the wild salmon. At this crossroads, we must decide. Will we stand by and allow our government to let wild salmon disappear? Or will we stand up for the resource that British Columbia was built on?